Hi everybody, welcome to my video on low temperature thermochronology. Low temperature thermochronology is a technique by which we can use geochemical measurements to determine how quickly rocks are coming up to the surface. And this is a hugely powerful technique to explore the relationships between tectonic uplift, climate, and erosion. And if you want a review of some of these relationships, please see our previous video on tectonic geomorphology. So I'll motivate this video by taking a look at the Cascades of Western Washington. The high topography of the Cascades receives up to 10 feet per year of precipitation as moist air masses flow off the Pacific and encounter the rugged topography of the Cascade Mountains. So this is an example of orographic precipitation in which air masses essentially dump their moisture on the windward side of the mountain range. If this extra precipitation drives faster erosion rates, it can actually cause unloading of underlying faults, which can then slip. And so one question we might ask is, does precipitation actually accelerate erosion and thus tectonic uplift within certain parts of an orogenic wedge. So how might we actually test this question? Well, we need a way to determine how quickly rocks are coming to the surface over time. And thermochronology does just that. So in this video, I'm going to first talk about the concept and some of the basics of low temperature thermochronology. And then we're going to look at how age elevation profiles can actually let us document changes in exhumation rate over time. So first, the basics. So if you imagine a mountain range with rocks underneath it, as material is eroded from the top of this mountain range by rivers, by landslides, or by glaciers, all of these erosive processes are essentially removing material from the top of the mountain range. That allows rocks at depth to move upward in a process called advection or exhumation over time. So essentially we're taking stuff off the top, which is moving rocks upward from below. Now, as rocks move upwards, they cool because keep in mind, it gets hotter as you go down in earth. So for example, this thermal gradient is 45 degrees here and 75 degrees here. So as rocks move up towards the surface, they actually cool. And the idea of low temperature thermochronology is that we essentially have clocks within certain minerals within the rock. And so those radioactive clocks start when the rock and the mineral pass through a closure temperature. Okay? So we're going to see an example in a second of a closure temperature of 65 degrees Celsius for appetite. So that clock would start as it passes through the 65 degree isotherm. When that rock eventually makes it to the surface, it has some cooling age. Okay? And that cooling age essentially records the amount of time it took the rock to travel from 65 C up to the surface. And so using the thermal gradient in Earth's interior, we can convert the closure temperature essentially into a closure depth. Okay, So in this example, a closure temperature of 65 degrees Celsius has a depth of roughly 2 kilometers. Okay? And, but keep in mind, thermal gradients can be different within Earth's interior. So uh, 65 degrees Celsius might occur more shallow or more deeply if we had a different thermal gradient. So let's illustrate this with an example of how we would actually compute exhumation rate of a rock at the surface. Well, we, need, we know we need to know two things. We need to know the depth of closure and we need to know the cooling age. So imagine the rock has a cooling age of two million years, okay? And so we know that cooling age was locked in when it passed through its closure temperature at, at a depth of 65 degrees Celsius or roughly 2 kilometers. So the exhumation rate 
is then given by 2 kilometers divided by 2 million years equals 1 kilometer per million year. So that rock came to the surface over the last 2 kilometers at a rate of roughly 1 kilometer per million year. So let's look now in detail at how this works, okay? How do we actually make these measurements? Well, a very common low temperature thermochronometer is called Appetite Uranium Thorium Helium Thermochronology. And the way this works is that we essentially separate apatite crystals from the rock. There's no scale bar here, but these crystals are about 100 microns long or 200 microns long. They're essentially almost invisible specks of dust seen here under a microscope. So in this technique, we would separate out the apatite crystals and within each crystal, we would measure the parent uranium and the daughter helium. And the idea is that uranium decays over time. And each time it decays, or, or many of its decays, emit what's called an alpha particle, two protons and two neutrons. Alpha particles are also known as helium-4. And so you can see uranium-238 goes through about a dozen decays before it finally reaches stable lead. And over eight of these decays, it emits a helium particle. So one parent uranium will emit eight daughter heliums, or alphas, over its decay chain. And the key idea is that those helium particles aren't retained in the apatite crystal until the crystal cools below 65 degrees Celsius, roughly. So what that means is that although uranium is decaying and it is releasing helium throughout the lifetime of the crystal, the helium gas doesn't start to be locked into the crystal until it cools below roughly 65 degrees Celsius. And that's when the clock starts. A very similar technique is appetite fission track thermochronology. It's based on the same idea which is that spontaneous fission of uranium leaves a track in the apatite crystal. So this is a, a polished cross-sectional view of a single apatite crystal. And each of these tracks are actually uh, showing where a single uranium atom decayed and uh, its broken particles left a track behind. So similar to uranium thorium helium dating, if we know the amount of parent uranium and we know the density of the tracks, we can compute an age. However, these tracks aren't recorded within the crystal until the crystal cools below about 100 degrees Celsius. So above 100 degrees Celsius, the crystal structure actually heals itself and anneals these tracks. So they gradually go away over time when the crystal is above about 100 degrees C. However, when it's below that temperature, these crystals don't go away. They stay and they accumulate over time. And we can use the relationship between the parent uranium and the density of tracks to estimate the cooling age of the apatite. So in summary, we have two techniques. They both involve the crystal apatite. The uranium thorium helium has a closure temperature of about 65 C, and the apatite fission track has a closure temperature of about 100 degrees C. And it turns out these are just two examples of a large family of thermochronometers. And what's plotted here are the range of closure temperatures for a whole bunch of different thermochronometers. So we have uranium, thorium, helium, and apatite. Fission track and apatite are two of the lowest temperature ones. But then we also have argon dating, uh, rubidium strontium dating, and uranium lead dating of a whole variety of different minerals that each have progressively higher closure temperatures. So different geologists use different thermochronometers for different applications. But in the case of tectonic geomorphology, for example, studying the links between climate and tectonics, the lower temperature thermochronometers are the most useful. 
and that's because the clocks start at the lowest temperature and therefore the ages record exhumation over the shortest or the shallowest depths, right? If we have something with a very, very high closure temperature, let's say argon, argon, and muscovite, instead of recording exhumation over the upper two kilometers, this might record exhumation over the upper seven to 10 kilometers. So a really different uh, sensitivity. So let's close this part of the video by returning to our example and our question. Does orographic precipitation across the Cascade Mountain Range actually cause more rapid erosion and more rapid tectonic uplift? So what the study of Reiners et al. 2003 did, they did a transect from west to east across the high Cascades. And they measured apatite, uranium, thorium, helium ages, which are plotted along this axis. And what they show is that ages are very old on the west side of the mountain ranges. Ages get young near the crest of the range, and then they get old again as we move off to the back side or to the east. So what is that pattern? Old, young, old. To translate that into exhumation rates, that pattern actually switches. And of course, the oldest cooling ages on the surface correspond to the, the slowest exhumation rates, OK? So on the west side of the range, we actually have very slow exhumation rates of about 0.05 millimeters per year. And those exhumation rates peak around the crest up to around 0.3 millimeter per year, and then they fall back down. And what Reiners et al. showed is that this peak in exhumation rate actually corresponds very nicely to the peak in precipitation shown by this gray line. So in this paper, they argue that indeed, the peak in orographic precipitation is driving rapid erosion rates which is driving rapid tectonic uplift over this localized area over time. So here they're showing the linkage between climate, erosion, and tectonics using low temperature thermochronology. So in the second part of this video, I wanna look at age elevation profiles. And I wanna motivate this with a totally different example. Here's a set of apatite fission track ages in the northeastern US, okay? So the red dots are young ages, roughly 80 million years, and the blue dots are old ages, okay? And of course, here's Vermont right here in the center. So what this plot shows is that in Vermont, New Hampshire, and part of the Adirondacks, the rocks have come to the surface much more quickly than in other parts of the Northeast, okay? They've come to the surface more quickly, and therefore, they're their cooling ages are much younger. However, and then this is a puzzle to geologists, okay? Why is this? What is this telling us? Why is it that the ages are so much younger near Vermont and New Hampshire? Well, this is a difficult question to answer because we don't really know exactly when exhumation rate was fast. All we know is that on average, over the last roughly 80 million years, these rocks have come to the surface faster than rocks in Pennsylvania. What would help us make better interpretations is if we actually had a time-resolved history of exhumation, okay? We actually knew how exhumation rates were changing at different points over that 80 million years. And one way that we can do this is using what are called age elevation transects, okay? These are essentially patterns of cooling ages over a vertical transect or a vertical slice into the crust. And I'm now going to work through an example showing how these age elevation transects record this. So first, imagine this scenario. Here's Earth's surface with a house on it. Here is a cross section going deep into the crust. So we've got 20 degrees Celsius at the surface going down to 140 Celsius at depth. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna run this forward and we're gonna exhume these six samples up to the surface. So we're gonna, again, we're gonna erode material off the top 
which is going to draw these samples upward toward the surface. And they're going to pass through their closure temperature at 70 degrees Celsius and lock in an age as they do so. So here we go. We start at 8, now we're at 7 million years. So this sample is passing through its closure temperature. It's locking in an age of 7 million years. Okay, if we go one time step forward, this has now locked in an age of 6 million years. We'll go another time step, and this is locking in an age of 5 million years, okay? So we're going forward in time. And we'll go one more, and now this sample's locked in an age of 4. So in these time slices I've been showing you, we've been exhuming at a rate of, z of half a kilometer per million years, okay? So the rocks have been moving upwards at half a kilometer per million years. And we can actually tell that by looking at the difference in age between these two samples, okay? So this has an age of five, this has an age of four, and they're sitting roughly uh, half a kilometer apart, okay? So half a kilometer of distance divided by one million year of time yields a half kilometer per million year exhumation rate. And another way to think about this, right, is that this sample came through our reference plane one million year ago, and it's now half a kilometer above the reference plane, right? So it's half a kilometer above the reference plane in one million year. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the exhumation rate. Imagine that climate gets drier or tectonic uplift slows down and we actually slow down the rate at which rocks are coming to the surface so now for each million year time step we're only going to erode a quarter of a kilometer okay so let's look at this from four to three this rock has now only come up a quarter kilometer now we'll go forward to two million years okay this sample is now reached its closure temperature. We'll go forward to 1 million and forward to present day. And now finally, this rock has reached its closure temperature. So what we see, if we compute the exhumation rate between these two samples, okay, we see that, that this sample has moved essentially half a kilometer from the reference plane now in 2 million years because it has only a quarter kilometer per million year exhumation rate. Okay, so now you understand how a vertical profile of cooling ages can record changes in exhumation rate. Let's look at how we actually quantify this graphically. We're gonna take all of this information, so we're gonna take these cooling ages of these six samples, and we're gonna put them on a plot against depth. And here's what that looks like, okay? So our seven million year old sample is sitting at the surface, okay? Our six million year old sample is at a half kilometer elevation and so on. And so what we see here is that essentially the, the distance between any two samples or the, the vertical distance divided by the age difference gives us the exhumation rate over that particular time interval, okay? So any pair of samples can be actually converted into an exhumation rate over time. Likewise, we can also fit a line to groups of samples that seem to represent a constant exhumation rate over time. So if we fit a slope to this upper set of four samples, we see we get a slope of half a kilometer per million years. And then likewise, a linear fit to these lower three samples gives a lower exhumation rate of a quarter kilometer per million years. And as you know, we change the exhumation rate right at four million years. And that's actually recorded by our age elevation profile. So here's a, a somewhat real life example based on a data set of my own from the White Mountains of New Hampshire, okay? So what we've got here is elevation plotted against cooling age and these are the apatite, uranium, thorium, helium samples. So we see two age domains. We see a rapidly cooling domain where we get a rate of about 60 meters per million year. 
and then we see a lower slope of about 15 meters per million year. So again, in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, what we see is very rapid exhumation from about 85 to 65 MA, and then we see it slowing down after that. Now if we bring a second thermochronometer into this, let's bring in Appetite Fission Track. And remember, Appetite Fission Track has a higher closure temperature. So for any given sample, it's going to record a period of time that is actually older than the helium age. And so if we bring in the fission track ages, that's what we see. For any given sample, for example, this sample at the surface at a half kilometer elevation, we see that the fission track is actually much older than the helium age, okay? And that's because it went through 100 degrees C much earlier than the rock went through 65 C. Okay, so these are pairs of ages, and each pair is from a same sample. And so what we see when we plot the fission track is that it does record actually an older period of time. These samples from the upper part of our profile record a relatively slow erosion rate up until about 85 million years. Okay, So the fission track allows us to to interrogate an older period of time. But as I just said, pairs of, of ages from the same sample, all right, so here's the helium age from this sample, here's the fission track age, these pairs also record exhumation rates. And what it shows us is that for this sample, it went through 100 Celsius at about 85, and it went through 65 Celsius at about 70 million years. So we can actually use that pair of cooling ages in the same sample to compute an independent rate. So in this case, we know it took the rock about 15 million years to travel a distance of one kilometer. So it gives us a rate of about 66 meters per million years, which matches pretty well with what we were getting from the vertical transect of just the appetite ages. So in summary, in this video, we've shown that cooling ages record the amount of time since a rock cooled down below some temperature called its closure temperature. And that closure temperature is different for different mineral systems. If we know the thermal gradient of the Earth, we can then convert that closure temperature into a closure depth, or the depth at which the cooling age was locked in. Now, if we know the closure depth and we divide it by the cooling age, that gives us an exhumation rate, or the rate at which the rock moved towards the surface. And that's really useful information. And if we go one step further, if we take a vertical slice into the crust, and we have the ages of multiple samples along a vertical profile, that can actually record when each sample passed through the closure temp. And if we plot that in age elevation space, changes in slope actually reveal changes in the exhumation rate over time. And then if we bring in multiple thermochronometers, like helium and fission track, we can actually leverage even further and record a lot of different changes in cooling rate over different time periods. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll leave you with these concept questions. See you in class.